Welcome back. This video is part two of a three-part series. The first part is called, What is a Bible Canon? I'm going to review some of the information from that first video, but even so, if you haven't seen it yet, I recommend pausing this video to watch it. You can use the card right here, or you can find a link in the description. All right then, so from the beginning, our series has been about answering this question. The Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration. Doesn't this prove the Bible canon is inspired by God? Since the Bible verse the questioner is referring to is 2 Timothy 3.16, another way to ask this question is, does 2 Timothy 3.16 promote a Bible canon? We are answering this question in three steps. Step one, make sure we know what a Bible canon is. Step two, make sure we are rightly understanding 2 Timothy 3.16. And step three, compare 2 Timothy 3.16 with the idea of a Bible canon to see whether it refers to a Bible canon at all, and if so, whether it promotes it. In the first video, we covered step one. We saw that there are two basic aspects to what a Bible canon is. It has to be a collection of writings, and that collection has to be officially recognized by a religious community as authoritative for their religious beliefs and practices. I created this chart to help people understand these two aspects of Bible canons. You can download a copy by following the link in the description. We also made sure to clearly define just what a collection of writings is. We did so by distinguishing between the idea of a collection and the idea of a category. These are actually two very different things. Since this is such an important point, we are going to spend a bit more time on it in this video, and I made another chart to show the difference between categories and collections. Before I go over it with you, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that when we're dealing with an idea as simple as what we're about to discuss, it can feel like we already know it. So what's there to learn? As we go through this chart, it will doubtless be simple and possibly even familiar on an intuitive level, but I'd like to ask you to put yourself in learning mode so that you can make sure to have the distinction between categories and collections as clearly defined in your mind as possible. This will help later when it comes to applying this distinction to our question, but for now, let's just make sure we really get the difference between categories and collections. Categories of writings are defined by characteristics present within the writings themselves. For example, if your category is a linguistic category, say English literature, then being written in English is the relevant characteristic embodied within the writing. Notice the characteristic is something embodied within the writing, not something that happens to the writing from outside of it. Collections, on the other hand, are defined by having been collected. In other words, in order to have a collection of writings, you would first have to collect them, and the fact that you've collected those writings is what makes them a collection. This act of collecting them is a process that happens to the writings from outside of them, rather than being a characteristic embodied within the writings. A connected point is that writings enter categories during the writing process. That makes sense, right? You start writing whatever it is you're writing, and if you're writing it in English, it embodies the characteristic of being written in the English language and thus belongs to the category of English literature. In contrast, writings enter collections after the writing process is finished. This makes sense too, right? I mean, in order to put writings into a collection, they need to have already been written. The next point of contrast between categories and collections is that all the writings of a category have to share the relevant characteristic with every other writing in that category. To use our example of English literature, every writing included in this category has to be written in English. To put it another way, being written in the English language is a characteristic which every writing in this category must share. So everything written in English 
is by definition in this category and everything in this category must be written in English. If the category is poetry, then all the writings have to share the characteristic of being poetic. If the category is nonfiction, all the writings have to share the characteristic of being nonfiction. Notice that this isn't just about the necessary conditions which an individual writing must meet in order to be part of a category. It is about an emergent property of the category as a whole. That is the exceptionless sharing of a certain characteristic. I know, exceptionless, it's a real word. We looked it up. We tried to find a more common word but we just couldn't find one that accurately conveyed the idea and worked in the sentence. Again, the idea is that all the writings in a category, without exception, share a certain characteristic, and it is this inner category, universal, exceptionless sharing of a characteristic, which is one point that distinguishes categories from collections. The writings within collections, on the other hand, don't have to share any particular characteristic. They could share characteristics, but it isn't required and it isn't inherent in being a collection. Again, all it takes to make a collection is to gather the writings together. This brings us to our next comparison point on the chart. For writings to be part of a collection, they have to be gathered together, whether into a physical or digital location, whereas writings within categories don't have to be collected. Remember, categories are all about the characteristics of the writings, not whether they have been gathered together. And the final comparison point I'll mention is that while there are no gatekeepers that are in charge of whether or not a writing is in a certain category, there are always gatekeepers who decide whether or not a writing is considered part of a certain collection. What I mean by that is, if you want to write something as part of a category, you can just do that on your own. Let's say the category is writings in the English language all you have to do is write something in English and it is automatically part of that category since it embodies the characteristic which defines the category. Categories of literature don't belong to anyone, so no one needs to and no one even can accept or reject writings from a category. With collections, on the other hand, there are gatekeepers. This is because collections belong to someone, whether an individual or a group. Thus, in order for something to be part of a collection, it has to be accepted by whoever has control of the collection. Let's say you wrote a book and wanted it to be part of the collection of books at your local library or museum. You would have to submit it to them and they could either accept or reject it. Like I said, it's very simple. But I know I did not have nearly such a clear understanding of these distinctions prior to working on answering this question. It really drove home to me how important it is to take the time to be sure I have a clear concept of even the simple things, since often it is when things are simple that we can feel overly confident and end up missing a key element. And the reason we've taken so much time to distinguish between a category and a collection is that one of the key aspects of a Bible canon is that it has to be a collection of writings. So it is very important that we understand what a collection is and to be sure not to confuse it with a category. Okay, we're ready to move on to step two, rightly interpreting 2 Timothy 3.16. To make sure we have it fresh in our minds, let's read it. This is the way it is most commonly translated. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The first phrase, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is what people most strongly emphasize when using this verse to promote a Bible canon. 
As I mentioned in the last video, the reasoning goes something like this. All scripture implies a collection of scripture. And since this collection of scripture is inspired by God, that means a Bible canon is inspired by God. As you can see, this whole interpretation hinges on the meaning of the phrase, all scripture. So the most important thing to do is to start by defining the word scripture contained in the passage. The way people think of the word today is that it inherently conveys the idea of divinely inspired writings or holy writings. But just because this is how the word is understood today, that doesn't mean that is what was meant by the author. We need to remember that we are reading a translation. So the word originally written was not the English word scripture. It was the Greek word that people often translate as scripture. The English word scripture is actually a transliteration of the Latin word scriptura, which originally just meant a writing, but by the late Middle Ages, it had taken on the meaning sacred writings. But again, 2 Timothy was written in Greek, and the Greek word translated scripture is graphe. And if we want to know what the author meant by graphe, we need to look at how graphe was used at the time this was written. Graphe was simply the standard term for anything written or engraved, including letters, literary works, royal inscriptions, drawings, and even paintings. As we will see, it did not have the specific meaning of sacred writings or writings inspired by God. And its actual meaning has been very well preserved in English words that are derived from graphe. Consider the most obvious English word graph. I'm sure the similarities are pretty obvious as we are probably all aware, a graph is something written or drawn, which is the most basic meaning of graphe. Another English word that derives from graphe is paragraph. A paragraph is a distinct section of writing, graph or graphe being the writing part. And although I'm just pointing out the obvious, a paragraph is a section of any writing, not just holy writings. The Greek word graphe just means writing or really anything drawn with lines, no matter what it is, sacred or common. There are plenty of other modern words that derive from graphe, such as biography, monograph, calligraphy, autograph, but you get the idea. It just means writing. The fact that this is what ancient Greek speakers meant by the word graphe is well known among scholars of ancient Greek. Check out this definition from a dictionary titled An Intermediate Greek-English Lexicon by Henry George Liddell. Graphe, representation by means of lines. Drawing or delineation. A drawing, painting, picture, writing, the art of writing, a writing, a letter, etc. Something you may have noticed that's missing is any reference to the idea that these writings, drawings, or paintings are holy writings, drawings, and paintings. That's pretty significant. Let's take a look at a few examples of how this word was used, starting with a Gentile Greek speaker who lived at about the same time as the authors of the New Testament. This is taken from On the Malice of Herodotus by Plutarch, section 1. Now, since he principally exerts his malice against the Boeotians and Corinthians, though without sparing any other, I think myself obliged to defend our ancestors and the truth against this part of his writings, since those who would detect all his other lies and fictions would have need of many books. So here we have Plutarch, a Greek philosopher, biographer, and essayist, referring to Herodotus's writings in a very negative light, I might add, and the Greek word translated writings is you guessed it, graphe. It is really important to take note of the fact that the word here just means writings, 
not sacred writings or writings inspired by God or anything like that. While this is just one example, it is a fair representation of how this word was used by Greek-speaking Gentiles. Even though Gentiles used the word graphe to refer to writings in general, it would be fair to ask whether graphe had taken on a new meaning among the Jews. In other words, did the Jews use the word graphe to mean holy writings? A great place to check for this is in the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of ancient Hebrew writings. Here is the Septuagint version of Ezra 4.7. And in the days of Artaxerxes, Tabil, in peace with Mithridath and the rest of the fellow slaves, wrote to the king of Persia. The tribute collector wrote a document in Aramaic also having been translated. The Greek word here translated document is graphe. Notice that it isn't referring to any sort of sacred scripture. It is referring to a document written by a Persian tax collector. The fact that the Septuagint translator used the word graphe for this document shows that he or she understood graphe to simply mean writing or any written document, not holy writing. We don't know exactly when Ezra was translated into Greek, but it might have been as much as a hundred years or so before any of the documents of the New Testament were written. If so, one might think that perhaps the term graphe had come to mean holy writings among Jews by the time the apostles wrote. Thankfully, we have the writings of a Jew who wrote in Greek at about the same time the New Testament texts were written. I'm referring to the historian Josephus. He uses the word graphe a number of times, and it is clear that he used it to simply mean writing rather than holy writing. Here is one example. And even Nicolaus, his historiographer, makes mention of this monument built by Herod, though he does not mention his going down into the sepulcher as knowing that action to be of ill repute and many other things he treats of in the same manner in his book. The word Josephus used here that was translated book is graphe. It is the graphe, the book or the writing, of the ancient historiographer Nicolaus. Josephus clearly didn't think that the writings of Nicolaus were what people today think of as scripture. So why did he use the term graphe to refer to them? The reason is that he understood graphe to simply mean a written text, just like every other Jewish and Gentile Greek speaker understood the term. Lastly, one might suggest that even though all Greek-speaking Gentiles and Jews used the word graphe to mean writing, the followers of Jesus may have given it a new meaning, Holy Scripture. But since we know that the word simply meant writing for everyone else, the burden of proof is really on those who would want to claim it meant something different among the followers of Jesus. We have many writings from the Christians who lived in the first few centuries of the Common Era, and as it turns out, they used the word graphe to mean the same thing that it meant to everyone else. Even as late as the 4th century and possibly beyond, Christian writers used the word graphe to simply mean writing. Basically, anything that was written. Consider this statement from Eusebius. Papias also gives in his own writing other accounts of the words of the Lord on the authority of Aristion, who has been mentioned above, and traditions of the elder John. Eusebius here uses the word graphe to refer to a written work of Papias, a second century Christian. Eusebius didn't consider the works of Papias to be sacred scripture, yet he still called them graphe. The reason why seems obvious when we consider all the other evidence that the word graphe didn't mean holy writing. It just meant writing. To state this as plainly as possible, even though the word graphe 
is translated as scripture in our New Testaments, all the evidence from the ancient world shows us that it actually didn't mean what people think of as scripture today. To ancient people, whether Gentiles, Jews, or Christians, graphe just meant writing, no matter the content, whether holy or common. With this in our minds, it certainly explains why the New Testament authors sometimes felt the need to specify that the writings they were referring to in certain cases were holy or sacred or inspired by God. If Graffe already inherently carried the meaning of divinely inspired writings, there would not only be no need to specify holy, sacred, or inspired graphe, but it would also be strange to add that qualifier to something that was already understood that way. It would be like adding the qualifier wet to the word rain. You could say cold rain or hard rain or heavy rain. All those would be fine qualifiers. In fact, if you wanted to contrast one type of rain with another type of rain, adding a qualifier is just the way to go. If all rain was hard, you would never have to say hard rain. It would already be understood by the word rain. This is why it doesn't make sense to say wet rain or to say holy scripture if the word scripture already conveyed the meaning that it is a holy writing. It would be like saying, holy inspired writings or sacred holy writings or divinely inspired writings inspired by God. That'd be strange, right? However, knowing that the Greek word graphe does not mean holy writing, it all makes perfect sense that writers like the author of 2 Timothy would sometimes add such qualifiers as holy, sacred, and inspired by God to the word graphe when they wanted to specify that they were referring to divinely inspired writings in contrast to uninspired writings. Now that we know the word graphe just means writings, we can clearly see that it makes far more sense. The 2 Timothy 3.16 is explaining that it's the writings that are inspired by God that are profitable for all these things, as opposed to any common writing not inspired by God. It makes even more sense when we read verse 16 in context with verse 15. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. In verse 15, the author finds it necessary to qualify that the scriptures, the graphe, he is referring to are holy. Again, this is because the word graphe did not, in itself, carry the connotation of holiness. It only meant something written. A more straightforward and accurate translation of verse 15 would be, and that from childhood you have known the holy writings, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. But now that we understand that the word graphe just means writing, verse 16 sounds kind of odd. All writing is given by inspiration of God? That doesn't make sense. Thankfully, this is just because this verse has been poorly translated. There are some translations, however, which render the verse more accurately. Here is how it reads in the American Standard Version, for example. Every scripture, or every writing, Inspired of God is also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, which is in righteousness. Now that makes sense. Notice that it does not say every writing is inspired by God. It says every writing inspired by God. I think we all recognize that 2 Timothy is not promoting the idea that every writing ever written is inspired by God. With this being the case, 
there is really no getting around the fact that the correct translation is the second one. Every writing inspired by God is also profitable, etc. This clearly means that when considering the writings that have been inspired by God, every one of them is profitable. Let's briefly recap what we have learned and how it impacts our understanding of 2 Timothy 3.16. Number one, the most relevant part of the verse in relation to our subject is the first phrase commonly translated, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Number two, the Greek word translated scripture is graphe. Number three, graphe does not mean holy writing, it just means writing. Number four, the more accurate way to translate the first part of 2 Timothy 3.16 is every writing inspired by God. And number five, the clear impact of this is that we can now see that 2 Timothy 3.16 is not making the point that all scripture is inspired by God. The point it is making is that every writing which has been inspired by God is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, which is in righteousness. Now that we have a correct understanding of 2 Timothy 3.16, we have just one more step to take in our consideration of whether this passage proves that a Bible canon is inspired by God. But I'm going to save that for the next video. You can find it on the end screen or in the description box. Thanks for watching. We hope you liked the video. 